This is an AQA A-level chemistry topic. We're on thermodynamics and this is part three. In the first couple of videos, we focused on enthalpy changes and we have also looked at Born Harbor cycles. In this video, we're gonna go back to a couple of the definitions from video one. We're gonna look at enthalpy of hydration and enthalpy of solution. And we're gonna look at an extra cycle that goes on this. It's worth pointing out that on this, there are none of the actual calculations, just building the cycles in most cases. So it's best to do this in conjunction with some of the exam questions that are available to review as well. As always, though, I'm going to recommend that you pause and have a go at the activities for yourselves. Um, and that way you get to know what you know and what you don't know yet. So we will take a look and we're going to look, as I've already said, at the enthalpy of solution. And we're also going to look at theoretical calculations for lattice enthalpies. So in terms of the definitions, it is expected that you will know alongside all of the ones that were in Bourne Harbor, what the enthalpy of solution and enthalpy of hydration are. Let's take a look at what this is actually going to look like. So we are asked here to build a cycle that shows an alternative route to the enthalpy of solution of solid sodium chloride. So to do it, you first of all got to know what we mean by enthalpy of solution. The definition is when one mole of solid ionic compound is fully dissolved in water. And we can see that what happens here is the NaCl, solid, breaks down into Na plus ions and Cl minus ions, they're both gaseous. Now that's root one, but we need to find another way to get from NaCl solid to those aqueous sodium and chloride ions. And we can only use the definitions that we have already learnt about. So let's think about this ionic compound. What else do we know? Any key definitions? And the one that I'm hoping has come to mind is breaking it down, not into aqueous ions, but gaseous ions, the enthalpy of lattice dissociation. Lattice dissociation or lattice formation are at the heart of every Born Harbor cycle that you have done in previous videos and previous learning. So we've now got <clears throat> one more connection to make, and it's how we can get between Na plus gaseous, Na plus aqueous, and Cl minus gaseous and Cl minus aqueous. And what we're looking at here is the enthalpy of hydration. The enthalpy change when one mole of gaseous ions is turned into one mole of aqueous ions. What we've got is something that looks a little bit more like a Hess cycle. Now you can draw these thermodynamically with up and down arrows, up for endothermic, down for exothermic. In terms of the calculation, this would more than suffice. You can see your two roots. I've got my root A going down and back up and root B going across the top. So let's have a go at another one. Pause, see how you do. Once again, we've got the solid ionic compound. We want to know what the cycle will be that shows an alternative route to the enthalpy of solution. Enthalpy of solution, I'm breaking my KBr solid into K plus aqueous and Br minus aqueous. I also know that I can do lattice dissociation enthalpy that will take me to the gaseous ions, K plus gaseous and Br minus gaseous, which gives me that same link to put in again, that my K plus gaseous goes to K plus aqueous. That's the enthalpy of hydration of K plus and the same for Br minus. And obviously, in a calculation, you would be provided with data that would then allow you to work out the missing piece of data. But we're going to move away from it ever so slightly. And we're just thinking here about the compounds that have been provided, LIF and NAI, that's lithium fluoride, and sodium iodide. What type of bonding do they possess? Well, lithium and fluorine, we put them together. We can see that that's going to be a positive ion and negative ion. So that one's ionic. And similarly, NAI, sodium is a positive ion. Iodide is a negative ion. So that's ionic. We're going to come back to that because we are going to need to add a little bit more information. It's not quite as straightforward as we maybe have previously thought. Certainly if you're seeing this for the first time. Let's look at two more examples though. CH4 and HI. 
CH4 is one of the structures that you've been drawing the covalent bond dot cross structure for years now. So that one, covalent. And HI, similarly, two non-metals. The expectation here is that we would see that that is also covalent. However, it's not as straightforward as that. Because actually, when we talk about the bonding type, we now have to appreciate that bonding is on a spectrum from ionic to covalent. You can have ionic compounds that have some covalent character, and you can have covalent compounds that have some ionic character. Actually, you can have situations where ionic compounds are predominantly covalent in, in their structure. So let's have a think about what this actually means. How can covalent character be exhibited in ionic compounds? Well, let's take a look. Let's get an example. Um, let's do NaF, sodium fluoride. That one, I will say, has very little or no covalent character. And we'll have a think about why in a moment. Will there be any more or less covalent character in aluminium iodide? And I appreciate I've only drawn one Al plus three and one I minus. This would be Al I three, but it's more about the representation of the individual bond that we're dealing with. So on this one, that will actually have lots of covalent character. And we need to understand why. Well, one of the things to look at is that a small, highly charged cation, aluminium plus three, that's the cation, it's positive. It's a relatively small ion and it's very highly charged, plus three. And because it's very small and very highly charged, it's very attractive to negative species, specifically the electrons. And there are huge amounts of electrons around the iodide ion. So what actually happens is this iodide electron cloud is distorted and those electrons are pulled closer to the aluminium. Similarly, a large anion like I minus will have a much larger electron cloud, which allows for much more distortion. Now, what that essentially means is aluminium ion here is pulling electrons closer towards itself. And in a sense, it's taking a share of some of the electrons in the iodide electron cloud. So it is what you would consider to be an ionic compound because it's positive and negative ions, but it actually has a huge amount of covalent character. And when you get to species like this, what you will find is they're not going to be soluble. They don't have the properties of ionic compounds that you might expect. Okay, now let's turn this around the other way. And you are familiar with this, even if you haven't thought about it in these terms. See what you can do. Now, the example that I'm going to give is hydrogen fluoride, which is definitely a covalent compound. So I take my covalent compound and we know that the covalent bond is a pair of electrons. And I've put those in the middle. In the videos I've done on the bonding topic in the year 12 playlist, I talk about what happens here in a lot more depth. But I use a tug of war analogy that we've got the ribbon in the middle. And then we're thinking about what's going to happen to those electrons in this circumstance. And what we've got is a significant difference in electronegativity. We've got fluorine, the most electronegative element. So because it's electronegative, that means it's going to have a far greater pull on the electrons in the covalent bond. It pulls them towards itself. Now, as you know from the year 12 topics on bonding, that then means that the fluorine has a greater hold on these electrons, and it creates a partial charge. It creates a dipole. The F is delta negative, and the H is delta positive. So we've got the dipole, we've got the partial charges. Now, if we then compare what's happening between one HF and another, there will be, in this case, it's actually a hydrogen bond, but it's an intermolecular force which exists between the delta negative fluorine on one HF and the delta positive hydrogen on another HF. What we've got here is ionic character. We've got attraction between charges.
There's a lot to take on here and it's worth going back over this and making sure you are confident in getting this information across and explaining it with clarity. Task 11, linking character to enthalpy. So let's have a think about what this data is showing us and let's see what conclusions you can draw. First thing that I'm going to do is I'm actually going to note the difference between the experimental lattice enthalpy, what you find if you carry this up, this experiment out, or you find the data by alternative means, because obviously we can use Hess cycles and Born Harbor cycles to find unknowns using other data. But that's what we'd get experimentally, for example, lithium fluoride, negative 1031. But actually, if we assumed it was purely ionic character in LIF, it would come out as negative 1021. So there is a slight discrepancy. There's 10 between them. On sodium chloride, there's a, a difference of three. And then it gets slightly bigger on KBR, gets bigger again on calcium fluoride. And then by the time we get to CDI2, it's absolutely huge, the difference. So purely ionic character, the enthalpy change would be 1986. Um, for dissociation, negative 1986 for formation. Whereas the reality is it's actually much, much higher. It's 449 higher, 2,435. And there's also a big difference with silver chloride, negative 890, compared to the pure ionic character value of negative 769. So now we've looked at that, what conclusions can we draw? First thing I'm going to do is try to break it down into um, these colour-coded answers because we've got here, where I've highlighted in yellow, very little difference between the actual lattice enthalpy and the assumed lattice enthalpy with pure ionic character. Now that tells us that there's very little other than the ionic character that's influencing the lattice enthalpy. So these are very much ionic character. There is very little, we could go as far as saying no covalent character, certainly with NaCl, it's so similar that it's within the margin of error. So if the actual value is close to being the same as the assumed value for pure ionic character, that actually tells us that we are dealing with something that is almost pure or actually pure ionic. And let's have a look at it. We've got very small ions. You're not going to get much distortion between from a lithium ion on a fluoride ion because they're both very small. It's also worth noting that in all three of these cases, we have got Li+, plus, Na+, plus, K+. Plus. These are not highly charged cations. And remember, it's small, highly charged cations that give more covalent character. When we move down to the next colour, and I've done calcium fluoride as 25, it's still not a huge amount. I would say that there is a small amount of covalent character there because it's going to use slightly more energy. Remember that this is positive for dissociation of the enthalpy. So I would need 2586 kilojoules per mole of energy going in if I were to overcome just the ionic character, the extra 25 must come from the covalent character, the extra energy that, that is needed to be overcome. When I get to these bottom two where it's much, much bigger, we have got lots of covalent character. 1986 covalent ca uh, ionic character for cadmium iodide. But actually, it would be 2,435 kilojoules of energy, kilojoules per mole, needed to dissociate that lattice. We're dealing here with calcium, which is plus two, which makes it slightly higher, but fluorine is much, much smaller. Cadmium with iodide ions, remember we saw in the example I showed earlier, iodide ions are much, much bigger. So their electron cloud is much more susceptible by distortion when it comes into contact with a positive ion. Similarly, chloride ions here with silver, you do get a significant difference. 
So we've got lots of a much more covalent character. But the most covalent character is clearly in CDI2, because that's where the biggest difference lies. So just for clarity, what do we mean by purely ionic character? Well, there are different ways of doing this. One, we're assuming that the character is entirely ionic. We are assuming that there is no covalent character at all. There is no distortion of the electron clouds. And what you may see when you're reading up on this yourselves is that it can be spoken about as a single point charge. So that's what it means when we talk about that. No distortion. Can you suggest a molecule that would have almost purely covalent character? Well, let's have a look. I've gone for HH and I've gone for FF. Remember, we're looking here for things that will not have permanent dipole, certainly, and that limits the size of the temporary dipole. If you consider that an H and an H, that's two electrons that are moving around and there will be very, very weak temporary dipoles formed, which means we get van der Waals forces between them. But we're not going to get a permanent dipole. And as I say, because there are so few electrons, because they're so small, there's very limited um, opportunity for the temporary dipole to get particularly strong. That makes sense that hydrogen has such a low melting and boiling point. And fluorine also, two very small um, atoms, they will form temporary dipoles and therefore induce dipoles in others. But we are going to look at these two as great examples of only showing van der Waals forces, limiting the size of those van der Waals forces. So they are close to, if not purely, covalent character. A lot to unpack in that video, I know. Three very different things to consider. All of them really important, and it is vital that if there are any questions that arise, that you ask your teacher about them to make sure that you do understand what's happening. That takes us to the end of the video. Thank you for listening, and goodbye.